Hello and welcome to another in a series of lectures on United States history. This is lecture number 11 and it's going to cover reform and culture in American history from 1790 to 1860. All right, so let's get into it. Church attendance was still a regular ritual for about three-fourths of the 23 million Americans in 1850. Alexis de Tocqueville declared that there was, quote, no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America, unquote. Yet the religion of these years was not the old-time religion of colonial days. The austere Calvinist rigor had long been seeping out of the American churches. The rationalist ideas of the French Revolutionary era had done much to soften the older orthodoxy. Thomas Paine's widely circulated book, The Age of Reason, written in 1794, had shockingly declared that old churches were set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. American anti-clericalism was seldom that virulent, but many of the founding fathers, including Jefferson and Franklin, embraced the liberal doctrines of deism that Paine promoted. Deists relied on reason rather than revelation, on science rather than the Bible. They rejected the concept of original sin and denied Christ's divinity. Yet deists believed in a supreme being who had created a knowable universe and endowed human beings with a capacity for moral behavior. Deism helped to inspire an important spin-off from the severe Puritanism of the past, the Unitarian faith which began to gather momentum in New England at the end of the 18th century. Unitarians held that God existed in only one person, and not in the Orthodox Trinity. Although denying the divinity of Jesus, Unitarians stressed the essential goodness of human nature, rather than its vileness. They proclaimed their belief in free will, and the possibility of salvation through good works. They picture God not as a stern creator, but as a loving father. Embraced by many leading thinkers, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, the Unitarian movement appealed mostly to intellectuals whose rationalism and optimism contrasted sharply with the hellfire doctrines of Calvinism, especially predestination and human depravity. A boiling reaction against the growing liberalism in religion set in about 1800. A fresh wave of roaring revivals, beginning on the southern frontier, but soon rolling even into the cities of the northeast, sent a second great awakening surging across the land sweeping up even more people than the First Great Awakening almost a century earlier. The Second Awakening was one of the most momentous episodes in the history of American religion. This tidal wave of spiritual fervor left in its wake countless converted souls, many shattered and reorganized churches, and numerous new sects. It also encouraged an effervescent evangelism, that bubbled up into innumerable areas of American life, including prison reform, the temperance cause, the women's movement, and the crusade to abolish slavery. The Second Great Awakening was spread to the masses on the frontier by huge camp meetings. As many as 25,000 persons would gather for an encampment of several days to drink the hellfire gospel as served up by an itinerant preacher. Thousands of spiritually starved souls got religion at these gatherings, and in their ecstasy engaged in orgies of rolling, dancing, barking, and jerking. 
many of the saved soon backslid into their former sinful ways. But the revivals massively stimulated church membership and a variety of humanitarian reforms. Easterners were moved to engage in missionary work in the Indian backwoods, in Hawaii, and in faraway Asia. Methodists and Baptists reaped the biggest harvests of souls from the fields fertilized by revivalism. Both sects stressed personal conversion, contrary to predestination. A relatively democratic control of church affairs and a rousing emotionalism. Powerful Peter Cartwright was the best known of the Methodist circuit writers or traveling frontier preachers. This ill-educated but sinewy servant of the Lord ranged for a half century from Tennessee to Illinois, calling upon sinners to repent. With bellowing voice and flailing arms, he converted thousands of souls to the Lord. Not only did he lash the devil with his tongue, but with his fists he knocked out rowdies who tried to break up his meetings. His Christianity was definitely muscular. Bell voice Charles Grandison Finney was the greatest of the revival preachers. Trained as a lawyer, Finney abandoned the bar to become an evangelist after a deeply moving conversion experience as a young man. Tall and athletically built, Finney held huge crowds spellbound with the power of his oratory and the pungency of his message. He led massive revivals in Rochester and New York City in 1830 and 1831. Finney preached a version of the old-time religion, but he was also an innovator. He devised uh, the anxious bench where Repentant sinners could sit in full view of the congregation and be in, even encouraged women to pray aloud in public. Holding out the promise of a perfect Christian kingdom on earth, Fenny denounced both alcohol and slavery. He eventually served as president of Oberlin College in Ohio, which he helped to make a hotbed of revisionist activity and uh, abolitionism. Revivals also furthered the fragmentation of religious faiths. Western New York, where many descendants of New England Puritans had settled, was so blistered by sermonizers preaching hellfire and damnation that it came to be known as the Burned Over District. Millerites, or Adventists, who mustered several hundred thousand adherents, rose from the superheated soil of the burned-over region in the 1830s. Named after the eloquent and commanding William Miller, they interpreted the Bible to mean that Christ would return to earth on October the 22nd, 1844. Donning their best clothes, they gathered in prayerful assemblies to greet their Redeemer. The failure of Jesus to descend on schedule dampened but did not destroy the movement. Like the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening tended to widen the lines between classes and regions. The more prosperous and conservative denominations of the East were little touched by revivalism, while Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Unitarians continued to rise mostly from the wealthier, better-educated levels of society. Methodists, Baptists, and the members of the other new sects, spawned by the swelling evangelistic fervor, tended to come from less prosperous, less learned communities in the rural South and West. Religious diversity further reflected social cleavages when the churches faced up to the slavery issue. By 1844, both the Southern Baptists and the Southern Methodists had split with their Northern brethren over human bondage. The Methodists came to grief over the case of a slave-owning bishop in Georgia, 
whose second wife added several household slaves to his estate. In 1857, the Presbyterians North and South parted company. The secession of the Southern churches foreshadowed the secession of the Southern states. First, the churches split, then the political parties split, and then the Union split. The smoldering spiritual embers of the burned-over district kindled one especially ardent flame in 1830. In that year, Joseph Smith, a tall, powerfully built visionary, proud of his prowess at wrestling, reported that he had received some golden plates from an angel. When deciphered, they constituted the Book of Mormon, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, was launched. It was a Native American product, a new religion, destined to spread its influence worldwide. After establishing a religious oligarchy, Smith ran into serious opposition from his non-Mormon neighbors first in Ohio, and then in Missouri and Illinois. His cooperative sect of Americans who were individualistic and dedicated to free enterprise aroused further antagonism by voting as a unit and by openly but understandably drilling their militia for defensive purposes. Accusations of polygamy likewise arose and increased in intensity for Joseph Smith was reputed to, and actually did, have several wives. Continuing hostility finally drove the Mormons to desperate measures. <laughs> In 1844, Joseph Smith and his brother were murdered and mangled by a mob in Carthage, Illinois, and the movement seemed near collapse. A falling torch was seized by a remarkable Mormon named Brigham Young. Stern and austere in contrast to Smith's charm and affability, the barrel-chested Brigham Young had received only eleven days of formal schooling, but he quickly proved to be an aggressive leader, an eloquent preacher, and a gifted administrator. Determined to escape further persecution, Young, in 1846, led his oppressed and despoiled Latter-day Saints over vast rolling plains to Utah. Overcoming pioneer hardships, the Mormons soon made the desert bloom like a new Eden by means of ingenious and cooperative methods of irrigation. The crops of 1848, threatened by hordes of crickets, were saved when flocks of gulls appeared, as if by a miracle, to gulp down the invaders. A monument to the seagulls stands in Salt Lake City today. Semi-arid Utah grew remarkably. By the end of 1848, some 5,000 settlers had arrived, and other large bands were to follow. Many dedicated Mormons in the 1850s actually made the over a thousand mile trek across the plains pulling two-wheeled carts. Under the rigidly disciplined management of Brigham Young, the community became a prosperous frontier theocracy and a cooperative commonwealth. Young married as many as 27 women, some of them wives in name only, and begat 56 children. The population was further swelled by thousands of immigrants from Europe, where the Mormons had established a flourishing missionary movement. A crisis developed when the Washington government was unable to control the hierarchy of Brigham Young, who had been made territorial governor in 1850. A federal army marched in 1857 against the Mormons, who harassed its lines of supply and rallied to die in their last dusty ditch. Fortunately, the quarrel was finally adjusted without serious bloodshed. The Mormons later ran afoul of the anti-polygamy laws passed by Congress in 1862. 
and their unique marital customs delayed statehood for Utah until 1896. Tax-supported primary schools were scarce in the early days of the Republic. They had the odor of pauperism about them, since they exist, existed chiefly to educate the children of the poor, the so-called ragged schools. Advocates of free public education met stiff opposition. A Midwestern legislator cried that he wanted only this simple epitaph when he died. Here lies an enemy of public education. Well-to-do conservative Americans gradually, however, saw the light. If they did not pay to educate, as they said, other folks' brats, the brats might grow up into a dangerous, ignorant rabble, armed with a vote. Taxation for education was an insurance premium that the wealthy paid for stability and democracy. Tax-supported public education, though miserably lagging in the slavery-cursed uh, South, triumphed between 1825 and 1850. Laborers wielded increased influence and demanded instruction for their children. Most important was the gaining of manhood suffrage for whites in Jackson's day. A free vote cried aloud for free education. A civilized nation that was both ignorant and free, declared Thomas Jefferson, never was and never will be free. The famed little red schoolhouse with one room, one stove, one teacher, and often eight grades became the shrine of American democracy. Regrettably, it was an imperfect shrine. Early free schools stayed open only a few months a year. Schoolmasters were too often ill-trained, ill-tempered, and ill-paid. They frequently put more stress on lickin' with a hickory stick than on larnin'. These knights of the blackboard often boarded around in the community, and some knew scarcely more than their older pupils. They usually taught only the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. To many rugged Americans suspicious of book learning, for them, this was enough. Reform was urgently needed. Into the breach stepped Horace Mann, a brilliant and idealistic graduate of Brown University. As secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education, he campaigned effectively for more and better schoolhouses, longer school terms, higher pay for teachers, and an expanded curriculum. His influence radiated out to other states, and impressive improvements were chalked up. Yet education remained an expressive luxury for many communities. As late as 1860, the nation counted only about a hundred public secondary schools and nearly a million white adult illiterates. Black slaves in the South were legally forbidden to receive instruction in reading or writing, and even free blacks in the North as well as in the South were usually excluded from the schools. Educational advances were aided by improved textbooks, notably those of Noah Webster, a Yale-educated Connecticut Yankee, who was known as the schoolmaster of the Republic. His reading lessons, used by millions of children in the 19th century, were partly designed to promote patriotism. He devoted 20 years to his famous dictionary, published in 1828, which helped to standardize the American language. Equally influential was the Ohioan William McGuffey, a teacher-preacher of rare power. His grade school readers first published in the 1830s, sold 122 million copies in the following decades. McGuffey's readers hammered home lasting lessons in morality, patriotism, 
and idealism. One copy exercise that incorporated reading, writing, and moral issues stated, Beautiful hands are they that do, deeds that are noble, good, and true. Beautiful feet are they that go swiftly to lighten another's woe. Higher education was likewise stirring. The religious zeal of the Second Great Awakening, beginning about 1800, led to the planting of many small denominational liberal arts colleges, chiefly in the South and West. Too often they were educationally anemic, established more to satisfy local pride than genuinely to advance the cause of learning. Like their more venerable ivy-draped brethren, the new colleges offered a narrow, tradition-bound curriculum of Latin, Greek, mathematics, and moral philosophy. On new and old campuses alike, there was little intellectual vitality and much boredom. The first state-supported universities sprang up in the South, beginning with North Carolina in 1795. Federal land grants nourished the growth of state institutions of higher learning. Conspicuous among the early group was the University of Virginia, founded in 1819. It was largely the brainchild of Thomas Jefferson, who designed its beautiful architecture and who at times watched its construction through a telescope from his hilltop home. He dedicated the university to freedom from religious or political shackles, and modern languages and the sciences received unusual emphasis. Women's higher education was frowned upon in the early decades of the, 18th, of the 19th century. A woman's place was in the home, and training in needlecraft seemed more important than training in algebra. In an era when the clinging vine bride was the ideal, co-education was regarded as frivolous. Prejudices also prevailed that too much learning injured the, fem uh, the feminine brain, undermined health, and rendered a young lady unfit for marriage. The teachers of Susan B. Anthony, the future feminist, refused to instruct her in long division. Women's schools at the secondary level began to attain some respectability in the 1820s, thanks in part to the dedicated work of Emma Willard, in 1821, she established the Troy Female Seminary. Oberlin College in Ohio jolted traditionalists in 1837 when it opened its doors to women as well as men. Oberlin College had already created shockwaves by admitting black students. In the same year, Mary Lyon established an outstanding women's school, Mount Holyoke Seminary, later Mount Holyoke College, in Massachusetts. Adults who craved more learning satisfied their thirst for knowledge in private subscription libraries, or increasingly at tax-supported libraries. House-to-house -house peddlers also did a good business in feeding the public's appetite for culture. Traveling lecturers helped to carry learning to the masses through the Lyceum Lecture Associations, which numbered over a thousand by 1835. The Lyceums provided platforms for speakers in such areas as science, literature, and moral philosophy. Talent talkers like Ralph Waldo Emerson journeyed thousands of miles on the Lyceum circuits, casting their pearls of civilization before appreciative audiences. As the young republic grew, reform campaigns of all types flourished in sometimes bewildering abundance. There was not a reading man who was not without some scheme for a new utopia. Reformers promoted rights for women, as well as miracle medicines, communal living, polygamy, celibacy, 
rule by prophets and guidance by spirits. Societies were formed against alcohol, tobacco, profanity, and the transit of mail on the Sabbath. Fad diets proved popular, including the whole wheat, bread, and crackers regimen of Sylvester Graham. Eventually overshadowing all other reforms was the crusade against slavery. Many reformers were simply a little harebrained, as they said. But most were intelligent, inspired idealists, usually touched by the fire of evangelical religion. The optimistic promises of the Second Great Awakening inspired countless souls to do battle against earthly evils. These modern idealists dreamed anew the old Puritan vision of a, of a perfected society, free from cruelty, war, intoxicating drink, discrimination, and ultimately slavery. Women were particularly prominent in these reform crusades, especially in their own struggle for suffrage. For many middle-class women, the reform campaigns provided a unique opportunity to escape the confines of home and enter the arena of public affairs. In part, the practical activist Christianity of these reformers resulted from their desire to reaffirm traditional values as they plunged ever further into a world disrupted and transformed by the turbulent forces surrounding them. Mainly middle-class descendants of pioneer farmers, they were often blissfully unaware that they were witnessing the dawn of the industrial era, which posed unprecedented problems and called for novel ideas. They either ignored the factory workers, for example, or blamed their problems on bad habits. With naive single-mindedness, reformers sometimes applied conventional virtue to refurbishing an older order, while events hurled them headlong into the new. Imprisonment for debt continued to be a nightmare, though its extent has been exaggerated. As late as 1830, hundreds of penniless persons were languishing in filthy holes, sometimes for owing less than a dollar. The poorer working classes were especially hard hit by this merciless practice. But as the embattled laborer won the ballot and asserted himself, state legislatures gradually abolished debtors' prisons. Criminal codes in the states were likewise being softened in accord with more enlightened European practices. The number of capital offenses was being reduced, and brutal punishments such as whipping and branding were being slowly eliminated. A refreshing idea was taking hold that prisons should reform as well as punish. Hence, reformatories, houses of correction, and penitentiaries, uh, for penance. Sufferers from so-called insanity were still being treated with incredible cruelty. The medieval concept had been that the mentally deranged were cursed with unclean spirits. The 19th century idea was that they were willfully perverse and depraved. Many crazed persons were chained in jailhouses or poorhouses with sane people. Into this dismal picture stepped a quiet New England teacher, Dorothea Dix, a physically frail woman afflicted with a variety of lung difficulties. She possessed infinite compassion and willpower. Never raising her voice to a screech, she traveled some 60,000 miles in eight years and assembled her damning reports on insanity from first-hand observations. Her classic petition of 1843 to the Massachusetts legislature, describing places so foul that visitors were driven back by the stench, turned legislative stomachs and hearts. Her persistent prodding resulted in improved conditions and in a gain for the concept that the demented were not willfully perverse, 
but mentally ill. Agitation for peace also gained some momentum in the pre-Civil War years. In 1828, the American Peace Society was formed, with a ringing declaration of a war on war. A leading spirit was William Ladd, who orated when his legs were so badly ulcerated that he had to sit on a stool. His ideas were finally to bear some fruit in the International Organizations for Collective Security of the 20th century. The American Peace Crusade, linked with the European Crusade, was making promising progress by mid-century, when it was set back by the bloodshed of the Crimean War in Europe and the Civil War in America. The ever-present drink problem attracted dedicated reformers. Custom, combined with a hard and monotonous life, led to the excessive drinking of hard liquor, even among women, clergymen, and members of Congress. Weddings and funerals all too often became disgraceful brawls, and occasionally a drunken mourner would fall into the open grave with a corpse. Heavy drinking decreased the efficiency of labor, while the introduction of poorly safeguarded machinery increased the danger of accidents occurring at work. Drunkenness also fouled the sanctity of the family, threatening the spiritual welfare and physical safety of women and children. After earlier and feebler efforts, the American Temperance Society was formed at Boston in 1816. Within a few years, about a thousand local groups sprang into existence. They implored drinkers to sign the Temperance Pledge and organized children's clubs known as the Cold Water Army. Temperance Crusaders also made effective use of pictures, pamphlets, and lurid lecturers, some of whom were reformed drunkards. The most popular anti-alcohol tract of the era was T.S. Author's melodramatic novel Ten Nights in a Barroom and What I Saw There. It described in shocking detail how a once happy village was ruined by Sam Slade's tavern. The book was second only to Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin as a bestseller in the 1850s and had enjoyed a highly successful run. Early foes of demon drink adopted two major lines of attack. One was to siphon the individual's will to resist the wiles of the little brown jug. The moderate reformers thus stressed temperance rather than teetotalism, or the total elimination of intoxicants. But less patient zealots came to believe that temptation should be removed by legislation. Prominent among these groups was Neil Dow of Maine, a blue-nosed reformer who as a mayor of Portland and an employer of labor had often witnessed the effects of alcohol. Architecturally, America contributed little of note in the first half of the century. The rustic republic, still under pressure to erect shelters in haste, was continuing to imitate European models. Public buildings and other important structures followed Greek and Roman lines, which seemed curiously out of place in a wilderness setting. A remarkable Greek revival came between 1820 and 1850, partly stimulated by the heroic efforts of the Greeks in the 1820s to wrest their independence from the Turks. About mid-century, strong interest developed in a revival of Gothic forms, with their emphasis on pointed arches and large windows. Talented Thomas Jefferson, architect of revolution, was probably the ablest American architect of his generation. He brought a classical design to his Virginia hilltop home, Monticello, perhaps the most stately mansion in the nation at the time. The art of painting continued to be handicapped. It suffered from the dollar grabbing of a raw civilization, from the hustle, bustle, and absence of leisure, the lack of a wealthy class to sit for portraits and then pay for them. 
Some of the earliest painters were forced to go to England, where they found both training and patrons. America exported artists and imported art. Painting, like the theater, also suffered from the Puritan prejudice that art was a sinful waste of time, and often obscene. John Adams boasted that he wouldn't give a sixpence for a bust of Phidias or a painting by Raphael. Competent painters nevertheless emerged. Gilbert Stuart, a spendthrift Rhode Islander and one of the most uh, fervid of the early group, wielded his brush in England in competition with the best artists. He produced several portraits of Washington, all of them somewhat idealized and dehumanized. Truth to tell, the famous general had by then lost his natural teeth and some of the original shape of his face. Charles Wilson Peale, a Marylander, painted some sixty portraits of Washington, who patiently sat for about fourteen of them. John Trumbull, who had fought in the Revolutionary War, recaptured its scenes and spirit on scores of striking canvases. During the nationalistic upsurge after the War of 1812, American painters of portraits turned increasingly from human landscape to romantic mirrorings of local landscapes. The Hudson River School excelled in this type of art. At the same time, portrait painters gradually encountered some unwelcome competition from the invention of a crude photograph known as the daguerreotype, perfected about 1839 by a Frenchman, Louis Daguerre. Who reads an American book? sneered a British critic in 1820. The painful truth was that the nation's rough-hewn pioneering civilization gave little encouragement to polite literature. Much of the reading matter was imported or plagiarized from England. Busy conquering a continent, the Americans poured most of their creative efforts into practical outlets. Praiseworthy were political essays like the Federalists of Hamilton, Jay, and Madison, pamphlets like Thomas Paine's Common Sense, and political orations like the masterpieces of Daniel Webster. In the category of non-religious books published before 1820, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is one of the few that achieved genuine distinction. His narrative is a classic in its simplicity, clarity, and inspirational quality. Even so, it records only a fragment of Franklin's long, fruitful, and amorous life. A genuinely American literature received a strong boost from the wave of nationalism that followed the War of Independence and especially the War of 1812. By 1820, the older seaboard areas were sufficiently removed from tree chopping so that literature could be supported as a profession. The Knickerbocker Group in New York blazed brilliantly across the literary heavens, thus enabling America for the first time to boast of a literature to match its magnificent landscapes. Washington Irving, born in New York City, was the first American to win international recognition as a literary figure. Steeped in the traditions of New England, he published in 1809 his Knickerbocker's History of New York, with its amusing caricatures of the Dutch. When the family business failed, Irving was forced to turn to writing. In 1819, he published The Sketchbook, which brought him immediate fame at home and abroad. Combining a pleasing style with delicate charm and quiet humor, he used English as well as American themes and included such immortal Dutch-American tales as Rip Van Winkle, and the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Europe was amazed to find at last an American who could write. Later turning to Spanish locales and biography, Irving did much to interpret America to Europe and Europe to America. 
He was, said one Englishman, the first ambassador whom the new world of letters sent to the old. James Fenimore Cooper was the first American novelist, as Washington Irving was the first general writer to gain world fame and to make new world themes respectable. Marrying into a wealthy family, he settled down on the frontier of New York. Reading one day to his wife from an inspired English novel, Cooper remarked in disgust that he could write a better book himself. His wife challenged him to do so, and he did. After an initial failure, Cooper launched out upon an illustrious career, and in 1821 his second novel, The Spy, a tale of the American Revolution, became a success. His stories of the sea were popular, but his fame rests most enduringly on his leather-stocking tales. A dead-eye rifleman named Natty Bumpo, one of nature's noblemen, meets with Indians in stirring adventures like the last of the Mohicans. James Fenimore Cooper's novels had a wide sale among Europeans, some of whom came to think of all American people as born with a tomahawk in their hand. A golden age in American literature dawned in the second quarter of the 19th century, when an amazing outburst shook New England. One of the main springs of this literary flowering was transcendentalism, especially in the new in the Boston area. The transcendentalist movement of the 1830s resulted in part from a liberalizing of the Puritan theology. It also owed much to foreign influences, including the German Romantic uh, philosophers and the religions of the Orient. The transcendentalists rejected the prevailing theory, derived from Jean Locke, that all knowledge comes to the mind through the senses. Truth, they said, transcends the senses. It cannot be found by observation alone. Every person possessed an inner light that could illuminate the highest truth and put him or her in touch with God, or, as they referred to it, or him, or as the Oversoul. These mystical doctrines of transcendentalism defied precise definition, but they underlay concrete beliefs. Foremost was a stiff-backed individualism in matters religious as well as social, closely associated with a commitment to self-reliance, self-culture, and self-discipline. These traits naturally bred hostility to authority and to formal institutions of any kind, as well as to all conventional wisdom. Finally came exaltation of the dignity of the individual, whether black or white, the mainspring of a whole array of humanitarian reforms. Best known of the transcendentalists, was Boston-born Ralph Waldo Emerson. Tall, slender, and intensely blue-eyed, he mirrored serenity in his noble features. Trained as a Unitarian minister, he early left the pulpit and reached a wider audience by his books. Perhaps his most thrilling public effort was his address at Harvard College in 1837. This brilliant appeal was an intellectual declaration of independence, for it urged American writers to throw off European traditions and delve into the riches of their own backyards. Hailed as both a poet and a philosopher, Emerson was not of the highest rank as either. He was more influential as a practical philosopher, and through his fresh and vibrant essays enriched countless thousands of humdrum lives. Catching the individualistic mood of the Republic, he stressed self-reliance, 
self-improvement, self-confidence, optimism, and freedom. The secret of Emerson's popularity lay largely in the fact that his ideals reflected those of an expanding America. By the 1850s, he was an outspoken critic of slavery, and he ardently supported the Union cause in the Civil War. Henry David Thoreau was Emerson's close associate, a poet, a mystic, transcendentalist, and a nonconformist. Condemning a government that supported slavery, he refused to pay his Massachusetts tax and was jailed for a night. A gifted prose writer, he is well known for Walden, or Life in the Woods. The book is a record of Thoreau's two years of simple existence in a hut that he built on the edge of Walden Pond, near Concord, Massachusetts. A sniff-necked individualist, he believed that he should reduce his bodily wants so as to gain time for a pursuit of truth through study and meditation. Thoreau's Walden and his essay on civil disobedience exercised a strong influence in furthering idealistic thought, both in America and abroad. His writing later encouraged individuals like Mahatma Gandhi to resist British rule in India, and still later inspired the development of American civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr.'s thinking about nonviolence and, of course, Cesar uh, Chavez. Bold, brassy, and swaggering was the open-collared figure of Walt Whitman. In his famous collection of poems, Leaves of Grass, he gave free rein to his gushing genius with what he called a barbaric yop. Highly romantic, emotional, and unconventional, he dispensed with titles, stanzas, themes, and at times even regular meter. And most people generally didn't like his writing at the time, and even still today. But there were some who did, and one of those was Abraham Lincoln. Certain other literary giants were not associated with the Transcendentalist movement, though they weren't completely immune to their influences. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow who for many years taught modern languages at Harvard College, was one of the most popular poets ever produced in America. He lived a generally serene life, except for the tragic deaths of uh, two of his wives, second of whom perished before his eyes when her dress caught fire. Writing for the genteel classes, he was adopted by the less cultured masses. His wide knowledge of European literature supplied him with many themes, but some of his most admired poems were based on American traditions. Uh, poems like Hiawatha, Courtship of Miles Standish, were very popular in Europe. Longfellow was the only American ever to be honored with a bust in the poet's corner of Westminster Abbey. John Greenleaf Whittier was the uncrowned poet laureate of the anti-slavery crusade. Less talented as a craftsman than Longfellow, he was vastly more important in influencing social action. His poems cried aloud against inhumanity, injustice, and intolerance. Undeterred by insults and the stoning of mobs, Whittier helped arouse a calloused America on the issue of slavery. Great conscience, rather than a great poet or intellect, Whittier was one of the moving forces of his generation. Not all writers in these years believed so keenly in human goodness and social progress. Edgar Allan Poe, who spent much of his youth in Virginia, was an eccentric genius orphaned at an early age, cursed with ill health. He married his 14-year-old cousin. He will uh, suffer with tuberculosis, hunger, 
cold, poverty, and debt. And uh, eventually uh, will die penniless. But he was a gifted writer. One of his works is The Raven, A, another of uh, his uh, short stories, The Gold Bug, which was uh, probably one of the first detective stories written, and his Fall of the House of Usher, the story of a man who goes to visit his old college chum, only to find strange and unusual things happening. And we also have authors like Nathaniel Hawthorne, who will write the uh, oh-so-modernly popular The Scarlet Letter. Been, it's been made into a number of different uh, movies over the years. Um, basically every decade, you've got a new one that comes out. And of course, Herman Melville's Moby Dick. And again, there have been quite a number of films on that particular book as well. The story of a man obsessed with hunting down the elusive white whale. America was a quick-growing nation. It had progressed, uh, doubling its population about every 25 years so that in 1790 there were only two cities with a population of some 20,000 or more, but by 1860 there were 43 such cities. The 13 original colonies had become, by 1860, 33 states, and the United States was, by 1860, the fourth most populous nation in the Western world, behind only Russia, France, and the Austrian Empire. But with cities come all of the problems of cities. Smelly slums, feeble street lighting, inadequate policing, impure water, foul sewage, ravenous rats, and proper garbage disposal. In a number of cities, hogs were allowed to roam up and down the streets feeding on the garbage. Though Larger cities had begun to replace them by the 1840s with uh, sewer treatment facilities. By the 1840s, immigration was a much was becoming a bigger factor in the development of the American population. Prior to that, it was only a very tiny number. Most of the numbers came from uh, natural born births in America. American women having lots of children. But why is it that they would want to come? Well, Europe was already pretty crowded there wasn't a lot of open land for people to purchase, but there was in America. Lots of open land. And a freedom of opportunity unrivaled in Europe's very class-conscious society. And it was getting easier and easier to get here. It was no longer an arduous three-month-long dangerous voyage where you might not survive. Now you could get here in a few weeks. To give you an example of the different ways that Americans have been greeted foreigners into the United States, we've got the Irish and the Germans. The Irish will come over in large numbers in response to a um, potato blight which caused 
starvation. It was the major food source for most of the Irish at the time and had replaced grain as the primary source of nutrition. Potatoes had um, four more per acre that it produced than wheat or rye or any other grain product. So you needed less land to feed a large family. The blight itself will starve off probably a quarter of the Irish population. So those that didn't, maybe another quarter of them will leave Ireland and most of those will come to the United States. They weren't exactly welcomed with open arms by Americans who were already here. There were a number of reasons why that is. One, they were of a different religion. The majority of Americans were Protestant. These were Catholics at a time in which there was still a good deal of animosity that existed between Catholics and Protestants. Another problem was that uh, many of them were illiterate. Many of them barely spoke English. Uh, the language of Ireland really isn't English. It's, uh, they have a Gaelic tongue, a language, not spoken too often by the Irish today. They've taken to speaking mainly English, but at the time, in the 1800s, most still spoke the Gaelic tongue. So again, difficult to communicate, illiterate, and very poor. So poor that they would take any job that they could. So that if they saw someone was being paid um, 25 cents an hour, they would go to the boss in charge and say, hey, I can do that same job, I can do it better, and I will do it for 20 cents an hour. Less than the individual who was working there already. So they would take jobs from hardworking Americans who were already there. Many of these jobs were taken from black Americans, and there were for a time, a number of race riots in uh, cities like Boston and New York. The Irish versus uh, blacks. But eventually that will settle down and in eventually the Irish will become Americanized. The next generation will go to American schools and think of themselves as Americans and speak English. <clears throat> and they will also be gifted with a great power, the power to vote. And politicians realizing that, hey, these people have the power to vote. We better start uh, getting things for them so that they'll vote for us. And with that, their lives began to improve. Politicians would offer them jobs. Hey, come on to the police force. If you elect Joe Schmo, uh, then we'll help you. Need a job? We'll get you a job. You need uh, food? We can get you food. Your kids need new shoes? We, we can get shoes for your, new kid, for your kids. New shoes for your kids. And as a result, they will um, work themselves out of poverty, destitution, and um, generally being disliked by Americans. Uh, so badly were they disliked for a considerable period of time that there were signs in businesses and restaurants that said, no Irish allowed, no Irish need apply, things of this nature. 
The Germans, on the other hand, when they came to the United States, they will be treated differently. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Most of them will come prepared. They won't be forced out because of a famine, desperate. Which means that they will also come with money. Money that will allow them to travel further west, buy land, set up communities with, and in fact sometimes whole communities will come from Germany to the United States to settle down here. And they were also highly educated. And Americans began to think of them as a welcome addition to America. So much so, in fact, that some of the Germanic traditions uh, were taken up by Americans such as the introduction of kindergartens. Kinder is children, the children's garden, where they grow like flowers with wisdom. And the Christmas tree is a German tradition. It will be brought to the United States. All right, well, with that, I'll end this lecture, and we'll continue on with the next one. Thank you.